Welcome to the ISO, the Gonzaga Nation Media Network. I'm your host, Dan Dickow, here with a special guest. You probably don't need a lot of introduction or background on this gentleman's uh, past and what he has meant to Spokane, the Gonzaga community. So uh, without further ado, th John Stockton, thank you for joining. My pleasure. Good to see you, Dan. Yeah, you know, you and I get a chance to talk frequently at the gym in, in passing. And so this will be a, a nice, fun time for me to get a chance to ask some other questions just to get to know a little bit more about your past basketball, your kind of thoughts on the game, your, your thoughts on some, some life things as well. So I guess first question, um, how did you fall in love with the game of basketball? I, that's pretty easy. It was, my brother played basketball. He played So whatever sport he was playing on a particular season, I was on his heels. And I was a ball boy for every one of his teams over at St. Aloysius grade school. And uh, when he went into gyms, they had to drop me like at Gonzaga. We used to sneak in the gym and they'd pull the chains back to to give a little space and they'd drop me down through the through the <laughs> through the top of the door. Yeah. I'd have to scurry around until I could find a window to open for everybody else. So I had a purpose and that's kind of how I fell in love with it. I wanted to be a part of it. The times have changed now because uh I read your book, your autobiography, and you told a lot of stories similar to that one uh that I remember, but times have changed as far as kids getting involved in sports. You talked about right there, sneaking into a gym yeah. just so you and your buddies can play. Um it seems like so many things these days are structured and I think there's positives to it but i think there's a lot of negatives of kids just learning how to play on their own absolutely you know my dad used to always say that that moms are getting too close to the dugout and with all the great intentions of trying to help their kids and protect their kids and things like that but everything's now scheduled and you're on a team or you're on a workout or you're on a play date or whatever it is that you do and gosh in our day we hopped on our bikes early in the morning we were gone till sundown and uh we were finding gyms to sneak into we were finding trouble to get into, crawl across bridges, whatever. But it's uh, it's a part of life that I think young kids are missing out on. Do you have a sneaking into gyms, trying to find gyms? Did you ever get kicked out of a gym? <sighs> Thinking back to yourself like, man, that was just stupid. Oh, I got kicked out of more gyms probably before I was 12 years old than I than I got into. Um, I mean, they didn't want a kid running around bouncing a ball all the time when they're trying to talk or teach or coach, whatever. So, yeah, I was always getting kicked out of Gonzaga. But it was always, you know, hey, kid, hey would you get out of here, please? <laughs> they knew I was coming back, but yeah. Uh, yeah, I was around. Yeah. I was lucky enough growing up. Uh, I had a hoop in my driveway, so I would shoot all hours of the day. Um, but then I was also able to be a, a member of an athletic club that uh, had indoor courts. And I kind of learned my stripes on those indoor courts where there was three courts. The middle court was the one that you had to earn your way right, onto. Right. And then the outside courts, you know, when maybe you were a seventh or eighth grader, you might start getting in a game um, and then you win. And then maybe the guys on the middle court will invite you to play right. towards the end of the run. <laughs> Once I got to high school and I kind of started proving myself, I was in that middle court regardless. We had guys that were back from pros overseas in the in the summers. We had college guys, same thing. Other guys that were, you know, your typical 40-year-old that's just going to beat the living heck out of a young guy. You've talked about your Sunday runs at the warehouse, something that's been a, a part of your career throughout. Talk about having to earn your stripes as a player in a setting like that. Well, I, similarly, I remember I used to sneak into Gonzaga later in the day. So he'd come home from school and practice and I would go grab the ball and go down to the gym. And I had a, a red, white, and blue ABA ball. I don't know if you remember that. It was just a oh, rubber yeah. ball, nothing fancy, but the college kids liked it. So that got me in the game. So they said, okay, well, you know, you kid, you, <laughs> if we can play your ball, you can play. I said, okay, well, I'm in. And, uh, and after a while, these guys got a little bit protective of me. Even I mean, I was so little. I was so little for a grown up for a little kid standard let alone a grown-up standard. So I was getting knocked around pretty good, and some of the students would protect me a little bit that way. But I had to earn it, and I had to pass. If it didn't pass, nobody yeah. picked a little kid to be on the game. Yeah. You say ABA. So obviously, when I was growing up, we didn't have the internet. We, so you didn't have the ability to have all the box scores and the stats at your finger. Right. So every morning uh, when the, we got the newspaper, I would pour through the newspaper, and I would look at stats. And anytime I was able to get to a library, I would – Rent, uh, would check out a book. And so the ABA was always something I was really interested in. So you grew up in that era where 
some ABA TV games were on TV, some NBA games were on TV. Who are the guys that you grew up loving and wanting to watch? Well, we didn't get a lot of TV games. And ABA, I don't think I ever saw an, an ABA game. But the one poster I had, one basketball poster I had up in my room was Dr. J. Okay. And it shows his, you know, his big mitts yeah. out there and has the red, white, and blue ball. And he's swooping with it. And it was one of my favorite posters all the way through college. Dr. J. You, you got to play against him. I did get to play against him, which was which was pretty surreal. Yeah. Um, the guy that you have a poster up on your wall for multiple years, and there you are faced up against him. So uh, I'll share a couple of my kind of welcome to the NBA experiences uh, <laughs> shortly, but what are, what would yours have been? Well, that one. I mean, it's Kareem Abdul-Jabbar was another one. Magic Johnson. I mean, we even though he's not that much older than I am, uh, he was a guy that we'd been watching and marveling at. Uh, probably the best NBA moment was Larry Bird. Same same guy, same era. Um, he walked in and kind of stretched in front of our bench one day before our game started. He says, I'm feeling like 41 tonight. And I'm, I'm looking around. I said, is, is any, nobody's popping out. Nobody's yeah. saying anything back. I said, well, this is weird. And he scored his 41th point to start the fourth quarter and checked himself out with a 20-point victory. And that was game <laughs> over. So these guys could back it up a little yeah, bit. Yeah, that's awesome. 41, and then he just checks out. I, my my welcome to the NBA moment would have been um, my first game. We were, I was with the Hawks. We were playing the Nets on the road. And uh, big dog, Glenn Robinson, Sharif Abdurrahim, Jason Terry were, were on the court at the same time. I get thrown the ball with one on the shot clock. So my first NBA shot is, here, you take it. I don't want to shoot one and ruin my field goal percentage. So that was a thank you very much. But I think every player remembers their first basket. My first made basket in the NBA was a left-handed layup in traffic over Jason Kidd or around Jason Kidd. How about yours? I actually don't remember my first basket. Really? I remember our first game was in Seattle. First league game was in Seattle, and I missed a three pointer at the end of the game. It was we they, we'd lost. I mean, that's why I was in the game. Um, and I got approached afterward by a media guy saying, "You know that if you'd have made that shot, this guy here would have won a million dollars." There was some sort of bet on the score. I don't know what it was, yeah. but I didn't need to know. But that was my one reminder of my first shot, first three pointer. That it was a business for some this, people, the gamblers. Yeah, yeah well, thanks. <laughs> yeah. I want to know. Yeah. Well, let's go back to uh, high school basketball a little bit. Um, you know, Spokane is, is there's really good basketball here, but it's not necessarily a hotbed like uh, in L.A. or Chicago. Um, how did you kind of look at yourself? Because I'm sure as a kid, you had goals, aspirations and dreams of wanting to be the best you could be. Maybe you didn't necessarily know where it was going to take you, but you had to first, I, at least this is how I've always thought about it. You have to set incremental goals. Hey, I want to be a good high school player. Maybe if I'm good enough, then I can become a good college player. But what was your high school career like? Well, I my goal was to make the team. I mean, I, I, I never felt confident I was going to make a team until I made it. Like once I made varsity, I wasn't worried about making it the next year, but I just never thought anybody would see um, benefit in me. And so every, everything, every day was a claw. I was fighting for for my life and tried to make the freshman team. I didn't make the the prep varsity as a sophomore only because the football team went to state that year and three of the guys that were on varsity of the year before were on that football team. And there was a new, I mean, there was so many things that fell into place and the basketball coach was brand new that year. So he wasn't waiting for anybody. <laughs> so I got on varsity as a sophomore. And that's uh, that's a pretty lucky time for me. I got to play every day with the varsity guys, great relationships and grew with them. You mentioned the new coach in reading your autobiography and then spending time at the at the warehouse. You see one of your youth coaches, the name up on the wall. Um, I, th I don't think good coaches get enough credit these days. I think there's a lot of parents that nitpick, probably myself included at times. <laughs> you know, I think there's a lot of outsiders that nitpick about everything that coaches do. But one of the things that, that when I read your book, uh, and you sit back and you look at it, and then you look at your career, having played for the same coach uh, in the NBA for the majority of your career in Jerry Sloan, you have a, a huge respect level for coaches, and I appreciate that. Where did that come from? First first level, sixth grade. I mean, my coach was a law student at Gonzaga, Kerry Pickett, and big scary man scared the heck out of us, and uh, boy, we learned how to work. We, ran, we had three-hour practices, and then we'd run – these things he invented called hallways at St. Aloysius grade school. It's about a block long and you run down the length of the school, up the stairs, the length of the school, back to the other doorway, back to mid midway, down the stairs and back to the gym. That was one. 
And then after a three hour practice, I'd run sometimes 80 of those for not closing out, <laughs> for not <laughs> denying the flash, for yeah. not whatever he chose. Yeah. And learn a lot in that. You learn what you can endure, um, learn what, what the rules of the game were, the fundamentals. And they became so ingrained in me as well as confidence in my conditioning that those carried on throughout my, my career at every level. And, uh, I think, you know, people ran, moms ran him out of coaching a number of times. He was too hard on guys. He was, you know, too rough. And, but he was instrumental in my career from start to finish. Yeah. I don't think, uh, would you call them hallways? Yeah. It doesn't sound like a lot of fun. They weren't fun. And they, and they were miserable. I remember crying one night. I was the only one left. The whole school was dark and I was running my 82nd hallway and coach said, you know, you're acting a little persnickety out here. I went, first of all, what's persnickety? Yeah. But secondly, you just ran me 82 hallways after a practice. And then he said, well, I talked to your dad and your dad said that, that, uh, I shouldn't let up on you and I should keep, you know, driving. And I go, oh, great. Now I can't even go home and whine about it. So he had me right where he wanted me and he knew it. Can't get away with that anymore these days. I mean, I don't, I, I don't think anybody would run 82 hallways without a parent stepping in these days. Yeah. It's some ways it's too bad. Uh, part of it is just time. Uh, there's no girl sports are, are so much more prevalent now and you have to share. And then there's a squads, B squads, C squad. Everybody yeah. has to participate with the participation trophies, which I'm not necessarily a fan of, but, uh, but yeah, there just wouldn't have been gym space to pull that off. And then to run it, parents would have been there and, and they did, but yeah. not in our group. We, we, we knew we were stuck. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's uh that, that's definitely something that, that I've seen from a, from a distance. I coached an AAU tournament this, this weekend down in Phoenix and just in between games, sitting in the stands, listening to some of the parents who don't have a clue. And I'm not saying I'm, a, I have a better understanding than them, although I probably, probably do, do, but just some of the things that they're yelling, that's one interesting aspect and one interesting point. Then you look over and there was an AAU coach cursing his player yeah. out and literally telling the kid there is no way he should be on the court. Get the heck out of the gym. Tells him to leave the gym. The kid doesn't leave the huddle. He goes back right back into the game. And coach just obviously he's upset about something, but he doesn't correct it. Instead, he curses the kid out. And I think that's that's uh, that's a, such a negative in sports these days. AU is rough. It's both the best and the worst. Uh, and it, it was something I participated in as a coach after I finished playing. And then you run into just that. You run into parents that that will sit on the end line and try to impact the game. They'll try to intimidate officials. T coaches are trying to intimidate officials, uh, which is which is easy to do because they're human beings too, and it's yeah. it's scary for them out there, especially when a community is around and they follow you out to the car afterwards. So it's um, you know the fact that kids are given stuff, um, you know, to join a team, you get free shoes, free bag. You don't have to work for anything. I, I don't know. There's a lot of bad formulas that I don't think are sustainable. And, uh, and yet it is the best opportunity to play and find competition. Yeah. There's, there's lots of positives about the AAU because it gets you in front of college, uh, opportunities, which is what a lot of people want to do. I, I know when I was coming up and you were coming up, there weren't that many of those AAU mm -hmm. teams that went out. So you did probably take it a little bit more special. Um, but you've also coached in that AAU setting for your boys. Uh -huh. Um, what, what was it like when, when you're coaching, and you're looking out and seeing all these college coaches um, evaluating your own boys and the kids that you're coaching and the parents are, are kind of empowering you to help them. Well, I think everybody that, that played for my team understood that we weren't necessarily playing for that. Um, I, I think you kind of get the horse before the cart or the cart before the horse a little bit when you start saying, we're going to play so that these coaches like us. I think you you play for your teammates, you play to win, mm -hmm. uh, you you play to play the right way. I mean, our, our groups were, our kids became very good passers. Um, they became great defenders and, and they were very difficult. Even though we're just a group of local kids, most of them went to prep uh, eventually. Uh, they, they could compete against some of the best players in the land as a group because they were coordinated and they would get after and they'd protect each other defensively. So, that's what I was seeking out that community, that relationship with them and that, uh, that understanding of how to play the game more so than the scouting. And, and I, I always believe if you win and you're successful at doing that, the scouting will come. Sure. The, the opportunities will come. Well, you, you can tell in, in listening to your answer and seeing kind of the passion in your eyes about that, that, that you want the game played the right way. And you can tell that when you watch, when I watched you play growing up, but that comes from your coaches. 
you know, talk about your college coach um, at Gonzaga because uh, he had to have believed in you um, and helped you in your ascension to get the opportunity to get to the NBA. I had two coaches there. One, first one, the one that recruited me was Dan Fitzgerald, and I owe a lot, really owe a lot to him. In my recru- recruiting trip, he said, look, if, if there was any chance you had of ever going to the NBA, I wouldn't be in here talking with you right now. And so what a recruiting, you know, what a <laughs> yeah. sales pitch. You're yeah. never going to be in the NBA. And he was right. And so, you know, I didn't go in there with any belief that I had somewhere bigger to go other than just be a Gonzaga player as good as I could be. So that was fun. And then he stuck with me too. And even though he he became athletic director after my freshman year and Jay Hillock took the reins and, and great relationship with him. He's a great coach. Fitz would continually come back and say, look, we need to work on this. We need to work on this all the way into my NBA career. So um, those guys were hugely impactful for me. Well, and then you move to the NBA. You get that opportunity. Um, you play for Frank Layden, I believe it was. But then the majority of your career was with Jerry Sloan, who um, I would love to hear your perspective. Because when I remember watching his your teams playing under him growing up and then playing against his team's coach for a couple of years, well-disciplined and everybody played for each other and you knew spacing, you knew timing, you knew uh, – what each action was going to to be and what was each where everybody should be talk about those coaches well both those coaches eliminated the nonsense and that's i think seriously missing from grade school all the way up is we wore the same uniform both practice and games so you had the same socks uh you, you could pick your shoes obviously but there was no outward ways to where you could separate yourself you couldn't come to practice with a different jersey on for example or a different t-shirt underneath or we weren't allowed to wear jewelry during practice, which didn't really impact me much. But <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say, you know, you got the gig, <laughs> mid '80s. You would have had the gold chains, right? Yeah, oh yeah, you know me, you know me. <laughs> but uh, that really made it simple. So we, nobody was trying to to show their dominance any other way than by coming and playing every day and guarding the guy across from you and trying to make yourself and your team better. So they really pushed that. I, I thought it was a great way to do it. Um, wasn't a lot of room for separation. We we were a relatively small market. So there wasn't guys making a million dollars on the side with a uh, advertisement of some sort. So it was a great environment for me. Perfect. Did you have a mentor? Because when, when I look at my NBA career, the one thing I, I wish I would have had was a veteran that kind of took me under their wing and really kind of helped me. I kind of had to try to figure it out on my own. And luckily I did enough to a certain point, but looking back, I wish I had a guy who really was like, Hey, nope, this is how we do everything. Who would, who would have been that guy for you? Well, it wasn't always, it wasn't always, I remember one of my first practices in training camp. Um, I go, I drove to the hoop a couple, first of all, Ricky Green stole the ball from me the first play in training camp. Um, and then there was a couple of plays where I drove to the hoop and goofed it up, threw it out of bounds, whatever. And so Ricky and his buddy, Jeff Wilkins were walking out to the car after, after the practice. And I said, Hey, Ricky, what? What, what decision, how do you know what decision to make there? And all of a sudden Wilkins pushed Ricky out of the way and says, stock, pass the ball is all he said. <laughs> so that was the mentoring that I got. Yeah. So I, I also got thrown in the fire. I mean, Ricky's not going to give up any good information because I'm competing for his spot at some point in time. Yeah. So I, to, I, for me, I never sought out the mentors. I had uh, Adrian Dantley would take me out to dinner once in a while and just kind of talk hoops. Um, Thurl Bailey, Mark Eaton were my two best friends right from the get go. They were a little bit younger and continued to be my best friends throughout my career. How was it to have a guy like Carl Malone where you guys, anytime he was mentioned, you were mentioned, you were mentioned, he was mentioned. How, how, how helpful was that? Or was it at times difficult? It was never difficult with Carl. He came in as a rookie. He was a year after me and uh, he wouldn't carry the projector or the uniforms or anything like that, which I did the year before. I said, Wait, <laughs> yeah. Why isn't this guy doing it? But then you watched him play and you say, that's why that guy's yeah. not doing it. I mean, he's, he was a, a ready NBA guy his first year and, uh, I think it's one of the greatest of all time. It doesn't get much mentioned in that because we didn't win any championships. But, um, man, what a special player. And to be connected with him, he'd catch the ball. You'd throw it up to his shoelaces. He would catch it in traffic and finish it and won. Just really a special, special player. So one of my other welcome to the NBA moments would have been my rookie year with the Hawks playing the Utah Jazz. It was one of my welcome to the mom- NBA moments, but also one of my most disappointing moments the welcome to the NBA moment would have been I got hit with a back screen from Carl Malone. And I swear, every vertebrae on my back, I felt popped. And it took me about three seconds to like, who am I guarding? And go find him. So that was one. But the other one is to this day, and I, I don't think you'll remember this. Uh, 
you always had like a set time where you were checking out of the game in the first quarter yeah. and then you'd go back into the sec in the second quarter a set time my first time of, against playing against the jazz where you and i would have matched up i was checking in you were checking out and i remember walking into the, onto the court and you looked back and i was like god dang i don't know if i'm gonna get to match up with john and we never got to even no. have a single possession in a real NBA game. No, that was disappointing for me too, because I had known you, you know, we'd known each other for a number of years by that point in time, and it would have been fun. Although it's like playing your brother sometimes. That, yeah. that can be both fun and not so fun. But I was looking forward to it. Plus, there's something about two Gonzaga guys on the court at the same time. Would have yeah. been pretty neat. But I, I do remember that it never happened, and that was a bummer. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I because I, I remember you and I talked after the game out on the court before you caught the bus, and, and my wife and I drove away. And I remember my wife and I talking on the way back to the apartment, like, man, that would have been awesome. Because I it would I, you don't play for photography or for pictures, but that would have been an awesome picture for me, like guarding you or, or vice versa yeah. to have had. Because I do have. My another NBA welcome to the moment to the NBA moment. And I want to get your take on MJ in a bit, but um, <laughs> we, that was his last year. And I went to the team photographer. I said, Hey, I don't know if I'm ever going to get a chance to <laughs> be next to MJ again. If there's a dead ball, I'm going to go walk over by MJ. Can you make sure you get a picture? <laughs> <laughs> so it's a free throw. And I look over at the photographer on the baseline and he nods at me and I got a, I standing right there where there's a picture taken Oddly enough, years later, a friend of mine, because my wife blew it up onto a canvas, uh, that picture, a friend of mine's dad worked the Michael Jordan fantasy camp. He got it signed from oh, Jordan. Fun. And Mike pick, pulled it out. I was like, what is this? Why is there a picture of me and Dan Dick out here? And and so the 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 friend's dad told the story and it was like, wow, well, tell Dan hi. But that's pretty unique. But to, you played with Mike. On the dream team, you played against him at the highest of levels in the NBA Finals. I, I think LeBron's a great player. To me, there's just something about MJ. Share with the listeners what Michael Jordan was all about, how good he was. Yeah, he's arguably the best competitor in any sport ever. I mean, it's it may be over the top even. It's If you're sitting here talking like this, there'd be a competition over space. I mean, I played ping pong with him once. Who won? Oh, he did. Yeah, it was a close uh, at the Olympics. And what amazed me about that was the the vigor in which he sought the victory. I mean, we're, we're just kind of, you know, we're sitting in the room. There's kids all around. We're just kind of batting it around. And it was on really quickly. And there was he was on a mission. And that's the way he approached everything. He sought that. He sought that. Um, it's not negativity. He sought that edge uh, in every part of his life, which which separates him, frankly. And some things I like about him, and, and, and again, I don't. I don't think it's just between those two. Frankly, I think that you know, I think Kareem Abdul-Jabbar has to be mentioned. I think Will Chamberlain has to be mentioned. Um, Larry and and Magic, Larry Bird and Magic Johnson, Carl. I, I think there's a lot of guys that fit into that category, and the circumstances weren't all the same and equal and all. But uh, anyway, so getting back to Michael, he uh, he had tremendous fundamentals, tremendous basketball IQ, and then obviously athleticism, but. He wasn't hampered by the athleticism. This was first. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what made him special. Yeah. And he never switched teams. Yes. But, I, you know, he ended up playing for Washington, but that's a whole different ball yeah. game. He wasn't seeking rings and and uh, trying to find the best opportunity. He said, look, this is what it is. You guys come here. We're going to, we'll get her done. And you have to respect that. Well, I love the fact that in your era, guys stayed on teams. You were unbelievably loyal. Carl Malone was loyal right till the end of his career. Gary Payton was loyal towards it until the end of his career. MJ the same way. Is that a frustrating thing for you to see guys bouncing around trying to create the super teams? Because you and Carl put every effort forward to win for Salt Lake City, for the Jazz. I think so. I think it's, I mean, I don't think you chase titles. I think you you go to work every day. However, the, the landscape has changed too. I, I think where I have issues in is is when trying to manipulate the environment. You're on the phone with you and I on the phone. Hey, who can we get here and do this? Um, I, I have issue with not, I mean, I think LeBron kind of won a championship in Cleveland. I mean, he was this close mm -hmm. the first year and then he rips the jersey off and can't wait to go to it. So would it have ever happened for him if he didn't switch? I don't know great player but we'd be looking at him differently if he hadn't probably yeah is there a player from your era that you feel is is undervalued that doesn't get the amount of attention or respect years later that they probably should 
there's all kinds of guys. I mean, it's um, Kurt Rambis, uh, Kevin Johnson. I mean, I'm trying to th- I think of guards for a minute, guys that were a load, and I played against a lot. Kevin Johnson would be one, Terry Porter, Mark Price. Um, notice they're all smaller guys, yeah. too. Um, but they're a load, and they, you don't hear their names all the time, but they are great players. Actually, I had a couple of those names written down here just to get your thoughts on some of those guys. Mark Price, Terry Porter, Kevin Johnson were, no were three of them that were written down. Oh, that's funny. I mean, because when I was growing up, I looked at myself as I'm probably going to be about your size, Mark Price's size, Kevin Johnson's size, even though I know I wasn't going to be that explosive. And so you kind of gravitate towards guys that, hey, if he can do it and if I can find a way to work at it, maybe I have a chance. Who would have those been those guys because you talked about dr j as being this figure that you liked watching um but who would have been the guys that you looked at and said hey they they made it i'm gonna give it everything i got and see what happens well oddly enough magic johnson be one of those guys and not because i thought i could be like him maybe 610 there's just no comparison but his vision and and how his love obvious exuberant love for the game is so contagious um I had an opportunity in high school, like you mentioned, AAU. There was I played on two AAU teams, which was only for like one or two tournaments in the summer. I played against Isaiah Thomas, and I mean, we went in there with a great team. We thought we thought we were going to win the whole thing, and I ran against the best player I've ever seen in my life, and that was Isaiah. And so he was, and then I watched him at Indiana, and then I watched him in the pros. I said, "Man, this is this is the guy. Mm-hmm. That's the guy." And he he never failed to discipline. He never failed to. Uh, get my attention and respect at every level. He's just a competitor and a great player. So I tried to copy him where I could. Um, he'd probably be the most. Yeah. And he's only a couple years older than me. So it's not like. And he's, he's small like us. Yeah. He, he may be smaller. Yeah. Wow. But explosive and, you know, smart. Again, the smarts keeps coming in. I don't know how it does it. No, I 100% agree. Smarts is so overlooked by the average fan. Mm-hmm. It's overlooked by, unfortunately, it's overlooked by too many coaches. You, you, you can separate a good team from a great team with the smarts. And I think that's one thing Gonzaga basketball has done over the years is, is they've had talent, but then the years that they've been unbelievably good, they've had off the charts basketball IQ. Yeah. Yeah. It makes such a difference. And you're right. I think it's lost. It's, it's tough to quantify that in a cre- recruiting trip because yeah, there's also book smarts and, and otherwise. So uh, yeah, to find a guy that has that high IQ, if they can figure that one out, it'd be great. I mean, even the NBA, I watched a few minutes last night, this kid made some great shots to win the game. All of them are bad shots. Every last one of them. And you kind of <laughs> go, you know, that's not a formula for success over a long period of time. And uh, and yet some of these kids pull it off. Yeah, the skill level in the game right now is is off the charts, I think, with, with some of the plays that are made and some of the things that guys can do. Um, when you look at the game now, do you like what you see? Uh, do you prefer – the era that you played in. And I don't want to get into that because it keeps coming up. Man, my era was better and this era doesn't do this. But do you enjoy watching it? Um, I I enjoy just what you described. There's some talent level. You watch Steph Curry. Um, it's very difficult not to be enamored with that. Yeah. It's uh pretty special what he what he can do, shooting, getting open, da 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 da. He's he's one of the best of all times, frankly. Uh, the game I'm less sure of. Uh, there seems to be less strategy. Get the ball up and and the freedom to jack a shot early in the offense um, baffles me. Where you want you run you know top of the free throw line to the top of the free throw line a couple of five yeah. times in a row where a shot just goes up and nobody's done anything. To me, I I, uh, I don't enjoy that. You know, I enjoy a little strategy. I enjoy toughness. I enjoy competitiveness, and that just seems like a bunch of snipers standing on a hill. You know. Yeah. You, just, you know, <laughs> send it can't be that much fun. Well, you know, I look at it in a couple different ways. I think nowadays would have fit me better because of the ability that coaches would just say, shoot it from three. I yeah. had coach, I had coach, a couple coaches are like, no, I don't want you to shoot threes. I'm like, what? Really? <laughs> That's what I do. That's what I want to <laughs> do. You know, and, and I had one coach that was like, I, I can't play you because you don't pick up 94 feet defensively. So I tried, but every player has a different skill set. Right. You fit in differently to different teams. And unfortunately, that was a coach that took over halfway into a season. And so I was kind of, I fit the other coach's profile of what he wanted in a backup point guard. But I guess the question I'm, uh, the roundabout way to get to the next, the point I'm, I wanted to ask you is, what are the certain characteristics and traits in your mind that can transcend any era of basketball? 
Well, um, it's, I, I think passing can transcend every year. I mean, well, because passing involves so much. I mean, I, John Wooden had an old line where he, he said something to the effect of a good uh, offensive player that's poor at defense is a disgrace. And when you when you break that down, it's because the guy that knows how to score and a guy that knows how to create space and get his shot off in all manners of defense, mm -hmm. he senses something about the movement, you know, the flow of a game. And that guy should be able to turn it over on the defensive end and be impactful, if not a lockdown guy, but yeah. be impactful. And so when I look at what overall what would what would fit into that, I would say the guy that can really pass. Uh, and I don't just mean coming out there and throw a chest pass that can see the angles, that can see the play evolving. Um, that guy is going to have success in a lot of areas of the game. He's going to be a good defender. He's probably going to be a decent shooter because it, there's it's 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 a fine mm -hmm. uh, it's a skill. It's a fine skill. So I think passing is it. Who's the best passer that you've seen in your career? Magic Johnson for me, uh, Larry Bird. Again, you know, that's why that's why I credit those two so much with with being of the greatest of all time. Is they they really could pass, um, but they also score. They did whatever was necessary at any given time. Yeah, let's go back to uh, Gonzaga a little bit. I, Coach Few to me, he, he was instrumental in my career. You've had a chance to watch Gonzaga go from Dan Fitzgerald, Jay Hillock, um, you know, to Dan Monson, um, to Coach Few. You were a player, then you were coming back in the summers and fall and working out with the guys. Then you were just playing with them to stay in shape. Then you had a son play for them, and, and now you're just you know a part of the program. You're you're interwoven more than anybody else probably in Gonzaga basketball. You know people want your take, your opinion on stuff. Uh, what do you what do you think of Coach Few and what he does? I think he's been amazing. Uh, he's had to handle probably well anytime you're there that long you have to handle change and the game's changed a lot in his tenure uh it's changed from from having great players but not a gazillion of them and not expected to go very far to now where expectations are that if you're not in the final four it's a little bit of a disappointing <laughs> yeah. season he's dealt with nils he's dealt with um portals um one and dunners to be able to navigate that scene still at what's a small market in a small market league is is just beyond words and he's done it with different coaches i mean it, it um tommy was hugely valuable this squad and he goes to arizona su successful there and he just keeps rolling you know mm -hmm. the next guy in uh, brian michelson's done a great job there too so I, I don't know how i don't know what that talent is i don't sit in their locker room in their practices but there's something special there yeah, I think his his feel is off the charts. From I remember when I was a, a player in practices and games, and then you go to the NBA and you kind of watch games from a different perspective. The way he empowers certain guys to go ahead and do things versus in substitution patterns, I think are, are great. Um, that's just something that I've always found. He will be a Hall of Famer. You're a Hall of Famer. What what will it be like for you to know that there's another former or another fellow Zag in in the Naismith Hall of Fame? I think anytime we have that Gonzaga connection anywhere, it's special. I mean, I look forward to it. I, I if I'm watching NBA games, I'm trying to seek out the ex NBA ex uh, Gonzaga guys. I mean, Rui right mm -hmm. now is playing so well, yeah. which has been fun to see. So, um, yeah, that's it's just a, we're all part of this one family, and when your family members succeed, everybody's happy. Yeah. It's unbelievable. Like the 10, 11, 12 Gonzaga players are in the NBA now. I think the only schools that are that have more players are Duke, Carolina, Kansas, UCLA. Those are the ones I can think of off the top of my head. So it's pretty it's it's absolutely impressive what's transpired and happened in, in Spokane and at Gonzaga. But there's always guys that kind of slip under under the cracks, slip through the cracks. Is there one former Gonzaga player that maybe you played pickup with in years past or you watched that you're like, man, I, I think the NBA missed on him? Probably. Uh, well, uh, Shemek, just in 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 recent times, um, and it's a function of what the league's become, that there's really no point guards and there's no big centers. Now they're starting to kind of filter back a little bit because there's some really talented big guys. Yeah. Um, but in that time, they weren't seeking anybody. They can't guard a pick and roll. They can't whatever. But there's also nobody can guard a seven foot whatever guy in there yeah. that can get an inch from the basket. So um, I don't know. I don't know if it's a miss as much as I wish there would have been an open mind to look at that. I, I mean, I, I see it a lot with guards. Uh, uh, 
what's appreciated and what isn't isn't always what I've appreciated and what isn't. So you make a good point, but to put a name on it's difficult. Yeah. I, I agree with Shemek to a certain extent. He couldn't stay healthy, unfortunately. But wasn't a great free throw shooter. Yeah, but his his ability to protect the paint was off the yeah. charts. And what NBA team at the time wouldn't want six extra fouls to go against Jokic or Embiid? Just yeah. be an enforcer. Yeah. And then offensively, he wasn't inept. I mean, you had to guard him. He's a good passer out of the post. And when if you go to the NBA and everybody's six eight guarding you, I got to think he'd have been even more impactful. But um, you know, they're good at what they do and see what they see yeah i i mean I, to me in my era the couple guys uh that came to mind that i wish would have got more opportunity at that next level would have been casey calvary because he was kind of that hybrid big that could step out shoot a trail three right. before it was like popular and then blake step i think would have been had he not had so many injuries both from his time at gonzaga then to play professional yeah it seemed like he was right on the cusp yeah. and you know you've done it i mean it's a lot of luck's involved. You 100%. Know, to be able to be seen at the right time, to to have a coach have faith in you at the right time can make a difference in whether you make it at all or not make it at all or make it for a long time or a short time. It's it's a, gosh, it's a fine line and there's a lot of guys willing to step in there in any opening. Yeah, the guys will fight tooth and nail. I for mean, sure. you were in the league at 19 years, I think. Yep. You know, I was able to scratch out six and, and people don't understand on the outside just how cutthroat that is. <laughs> It's I got traded my my third year and I had the New Orleans general manager when I flew in on the phone. First, he told, hey, don't bring your don't bring your family because we were living in uh, Dallas at the time, got traded in December. Don't bring your family. I'm like, what? My there's my wife, daughter, we'd have nobody in Dallas. They're, they might as well come uh, to New Orleans and I get to shoot around the next day. They're on a flight later that day. But the general manager basically said, yeah, we don't know how long you're going to be here. We, we, we might be waving you. So uh, don't get too comfortable. <laughs> Boy, welcome. Yes. Welcome, Dan. Welcome to New Orleans. Yeah. It ended up working out well because that was my, the, the best stretch I had. But it kind of shows just how cutthroat things are in that business. It's hard. I mean, and I, I think back what how things could have been. I mean, I after about my third, fourth year, I guess, there was some interest from other teams. You'd kind of get a little whisper, hey, you know, let your contract expire and go there. And it was never appealing to me, but I always wondered what if, if I'd have done that, my career could have been four years. You, you get to another place, their coaches change. They appreciate what you do less. Uh, Utah always appreciated, the coaches always appreciated what I did and saw, fa uh, saw a place for it. And we just, we just, Enjoyed a long, long time together, which I'm always grateful for. My family's grateful for it. Yeah. 19 years in one place. I think the only other guy I can think of quickly off the top of my head would be Dirk that had a, a longevity in the same place. Kobe on a, would have been in L.A. for about the same amount of time. But during the whole course of your career, did you know when you were done, you were moving back to Spokane? No. In fact, that was... I mean, I, I, had, I wouldn't say laying up late at night thinking about it, but it's never far from my mind. What am I doing here? I got, I've got kids that are starting high school. I've got uh, a newborn. Just where does, where does life place me here shortly? Um, and where do we want to live? And gosh, so many things. I love Salt Lake, love the community, but that community was going to change. The moment you retire, as you know, or mm -hmm. you're, you're no longer on that team, you're no longer on that team. Yeah. Running around the Delta Center, join the wives room, you know, the community, sense of community, even though that still continued to this day, it's not the same as when you're playing. So I knew that would go away and I knew my family was at home. And um, I don't know, we, it, my wife and I struggled with that for quite a while. In fact, uh, we didn't unpack the house that we left Salt Lake. When we moved back to Spokane, it still had food in it from two and a half years before. <laughs> In the fridge, it was kind of interesting to clean that out yeah. because when we when we made that decision, it was instantaneous, and we were off and running. Kids in high school, kids in grade school, kid, da, da 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 da. So it was a busy, busy time. You know, one thing I've always uh, appreciated about getting to know you a little bit more over the last however many years is you st you stay involved and you try to coach your kids' teams. But you've when I've seen you've coached as an assistant coach with I think your daughter's high school teams. I, how difficult is it to be an assistant coach when you know, I mean, not, not taking anything away from the head coach, but the bre the depth of knowledge that you have, uh, what is that like? It's different. Um, you know, even, even though you said depth of knowledge, if the, 
played 19 years and then all the years that came with it, there's a lot of just experience, but it's different than coaching. And I didn't mean I understood high school girls basketball or, or AAU girls basketball or high school boys basketball for that matter when it came. So when I came back, I was coaching like eight teams, soccer, volleyball, football, whatever, assistant, assistant, assistant yeah. allows you to get to all of them, but uh, doesn't allow you to have all the input that you'd want. So it, it, it took some figuring. John Stockton, soccer coach and volleyball coach. How does that work? Or how, what's your philosophies? Again, there were head coaches. One, of, it's a great story. One of my youngest, my youngest Sam, his buddy uh, Ned was on his team from Little League Soccer, and his mom asked him one day, "Well, how's Coach Stockton?" And once basketball season came around, she goes, "Well, I don't know what he knows about basketball, but he was a heck of a soccer coach." <laughs> Just shows you, you know, what they know first yeah. of all. But uh, you know, it's it's the same. You, you you try to teach good practice habits. Yeah, you get used to concentrating. It's so there's value in all of it. Concentration's a big deal. Uh, listening to rules, big deal. Eye contact, big deal. Position, spacing, balance, strength, speed. They're all applicable in all those sports. And if you don't have any of them, then it's pretty much possible to progress. Yeah. Well, let's talk about the the ability to represent Team USA on two different occasions, 92 Olympics and then the 96. But everybody always talks about the 92 Olympics and rightfully so. You didn't get to play, if I remember correctly, in the tournament in Americas because you were injured. And what was that like being a part of this team that's the best basketball team ever assembled, but you couldn't play early on and you got back and you played in the Olympics and was a part of the best team ever? I was part of it all the way into the the tournament. First of all, if we'd have won the Olympics the year the Olympics before, we wouldn't have had to play in the Tournament of Americas. It was scheduled to be in South America, and somebody bought that to have it in Portland. And so I get hurt, what second or third game? I think it was against Canada there. So I had been part of all the practices, okay. all the games, and it was basketball heaven. It really was just what a great experience to play basketball with a group a group like that. But uh, then I do get hurt, and so it took me all the way from then till. Um, metal round to be able to until i could get back i broke my fibula you healed as quickly as is most as any athlete and that's one thing i've always loved and appreciated about when you look at your career 19 years i think 16 of them you played every game whether 17. it was 17 yeah whether it was 82 games yeah. or the lockout shortened season so you, you never that's took a day point. off yeah how much pride do you have in that tons um you know you're being accountable for your teammates and them for you and, and uh, being ready every day and, and bringing it every day, I think is a, is a talent that again is overlooked. Um, right now they have these days off, what do they call that? Uh, uh, load, load management, uh, load management, which, and, and I know of, I know of people that use their savings to go watch games. And, and if you're not there that day, I mean, how fair is that? And plus, what kind of example are we? We're trying to teach the youth. What's not all about us. We're trying to teach the youth how to be good citizens. And we take a week or a month off just to rest. Uh, I don't know. I, I think we're missing the boat there. So with that, playing all those games, never missing a practice, you had to figure out how to stay optimal health and be ready to go every single practice, every single night and be dependable. Did you have a certain routine or a, a protocol of conditioning and training to get yourself ready to go and, and to take care of your body? Absolutely. And started in grade school with Coach Pickett, who we talked about earlier, and, and just the habits of being in great shape and what those benefits are carried on. Then we, I ran into Steve DeLong at Gonzaga. He's the trainer there. And uh, I don't know where where my career would have ever been without him. Uh, taught me how to lift weights, taught me how to do it without injuring myself, um, how to be ready and not overdoing it. You know, so he, he always felt that if you can make players better, great in a weight room. But if you hurt them, you know, what, what are we here for? So I learned great habits in the weight room, great habits in training and, and always came to seasons in great shape. Then I get there and the big key for me was Craig Bueller. Uh, he's a chiropractor who I thought was a quack to begin with. I wouldn't use him for a couple of years. And then one by one, he fixed I mean, just miracle cures for me. He fixed a tendonitis that I had for a year and a half. He he fixed a back is issue that I took cortisone shot for and it came back and fixed it in minutes. And so that was really eye-opening for me to see what the body's ability to heal is when given the right nutrients and the right care, um, muscle work in his case. And um, I don't know where my career would have been without him. I credit a lot of those years with him. You put me in touch with him and I, I had a couple different opportunities to, to 
work with him during my career. And after I left, and I think I told you this before, after a three day session in Salt Lake, I left to go to a training camp and it was the healthiest I had felt in my whole entire career. Yeah. Things that were bothering me before were gone and they, they held for as long as possible. Um, but when, when you talk about the, the, your body kind of healing itself, taking care of itself, why don't more pros organizations take advantage of that? Because you're seeing all like I remember in college when I was at University of Washington. Here, take this. Here, take this. And when I got to Gonzaga and you and I started getting to know each other a little bit, we would talk about some of this stuff after our shooting sessions. I tailored as much of that out as I could. But why don't more organizations follow that type of protocol? Well, there's probably not a lot of Craig Bueller's around. I mean, I, I don't know. Um, but I haven't seen a lot of guys that are skilled at, at uh, particularly athletic stuff. As he, he just activates muscles and everything in, works in balance and in strength and there's no vulnerabilities. Uh, so there's probably not a lot of guys like him. But but here's a here's a mental example. So we had, we were, uh, Charles Barkley was playing for Phoenix and he was missing the whole season so far. And they, because we'd been in the Olympics the year before together, we were somewhat friends and we were telling him, hey, you got to try this Dr. Bueller out. It just fixes stuff. I mean, it's whatever's bugging you, it'll fix it. And so he comes to town when Phoenix is playing us and goes to see him for a couple of days and bam, the next day, the day after he plays us, he's healthy for the first time all year and starts playing. And of course, they have a marvelous season. So their team calls our team. What are you doing having, you know, your doctor treat our guy? How dare you? Not, 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 hey, thanks. What did you do? Yeah. Can we learn that? It's how dare you touch our player? Similarly, our team was mad at Bueller for treating a guy from another team, which I get. Uh, now you've just probably made guy the guy healthy. It's going to knock us out <laughs> yeah. of the playoffs. Yeah. So, you know, so both of them have a point. Um, but nobody in it said, wow, what's he doing that's special? Why aren't, why aren't we all doing it? And I don't get that. Um, I, think, I think, I like to think that would be the question I would ask. So how come... How, how come you don't, how come you think maybe not enough guys take that approach? Because if, if, if people were to look at the longevity that you had in your career, I would imagine, I think Carl Malone probably used a similar approach. And until he went to the Lakers, he was one of the most durable players as well. I mean, why don't more te- players do you think take that approach? Well, whether it's politics or medicine, I don't know. We've seen it through COVID, what, with the impact of medicine and what's how people hold on to stuff that's, Hey, this is the medical protocol. I mean, an ankle sprain, six to eight weeks. With Dr. Bueller, you're back the next day. It's a little sore, but you're stable, balanced. You're not going to hurt it anymore, and you can play. And so, um, you know, uh, mono, mono can be several weeks um, through stuff he does. You're back in five days medically. That's going through your medical doctor. So, I mean, I've just seen miracle after miracle, and they, and yet they don't pursue it. Um, I think mostly because they, it's so protective. Look, this is our training room. The trainer has to protect his athletes. You can't, for example, if you said, I have a great guy that works, you can't just go, go ahead, Dan, go. Because yeah. your reputation, your your job of keeping these guys healthy is on the line. You can't just ferret them out or send them out to anybody you want to. So I, I think there's some of that. I think medical doctors think they're quacks. Um, I, I know so. I, I've heard them say so. Yeah. And uh, I don't know. It's frustrating. They should work together. That's funny. You make that point because I... I was in summer league. I'm not going to say the team I was playing with, but it was in Salt Lake City. And I went to see Bueller two days and I asked the trainer to go with me. He said, no, I'm not going. I said, why not? Don't you want to just learn? Because I kind of shared that the connection to you and, and Bueller and uh, he, he wouldn't go. He wouldn't go up there with me because it wasn't part of what his background was. Yeah. So you, you mentioned the COVID stuff and, and you can go in as depth as you'd like, but you got unfairly criticized with some of your comments, or I don't even think they're comments. I think they're just truthful statements about COVID um, because you have had the opportunity to be, as we've just discussed, unbelievably healthy, healthier than probably anybody in NBA history. Yet people don't want to take your word for it. Yet you've been as durable and as healthy as anybody in NBA history. The injuries that you've had, you've healed from quicker than most. Again, back to Dr. Buer, he, he opened my eyes to a lot of things. And you know, like, if you get an injury, it's a warning light. Uh, if you get, a, if you have a pain in your shoulder, it's a warning light. Look here, look here. What do we do in medicine? We say, okay, well, you need an anti-inflammatory or a surgery. That's your, you open that book and that those are your two, cho- or physical therapy. 
into physical therapy doesn't work. It helps you adapt around the issue. If you can reactivate a single muscle, like if you if you can activate one single muscle and now your bones are are lined up the way they're supposed to be, the muscles are working in the timing they're supposed to be working. You just don't have injury. You don't have connective tissue and tissue injury, and you don't have bone is issues. So it's very superficial at first. And if you keep it that way, you keep those muscles working the way they're supposed to. It's easy. Um, drugs just mask it, and that goes from the ibuprofens of the world, the acetaminophen. It's it goes to your brain to tell you don't think about that warning light. It's not here, even though it hurts. Doesn't yeah. don't look here. We have all these brain issues now. We have you know people having so many psychological, neurological problems and nobody's looking at medicine you know medicine is not good for it's it's chemicals that we don't need and yet we just keep you know forcing them on folks and uh, to their detriment it's one of those things where like i have a i have a background of faith i believe in in god god created the human body as an unbelievable, unbelievable. uh vessel to do different things yeah i would imagine he would have created it in such a way that it can heal itself if put in the right optimal framework of, of what it needs. Oh, absolutely. And it could be a nutritional issue. It can be an emotional issue. I mean, there's so many things that go into it. That's all poo pooed by medicine. So, I mean, they, the, the AMA has tried to run uh, chiropractors out and try to get, so insurance doesn't cover. It's already difficult enough. Acupuncturist, you know, whatever uh, uh, osteopaths, nature paths. I mean, these guys all have value. These guys, gals all have value in different ways of healing and we don't explore them. We all, we all take the allopathic route, which is the medical route. And I think even though it's hugely successful, sometimes it's also comes at a cost. Well, I think it's, it's, I mean, I think there's a time and a place for a lot of different things. It's like a golfer. There's, there's a reason you have 50 different golf clubs in your bag. So <laughs> if you have this shot, you need to use that club. You know, I, I think that too many times people don't look at all the options that are out there and figure out the one that works best for them as opposed to just, Hey, this is the easy route. Yeah. Well, back pain, back pain, again, it's either meds or surgery. And so our physical therapy, you, if you can fix that back pain without any of the above, wouldn't you want to do that? And, and it doesn't take long. And so you keep that balance in your spine to where there's never, you know, that, that guy wire is not pulling you out of shape. Then you're going to stay pretty true to, to how your body's supposed to be. And you're not going to have connective tissue into or injuries or bony injuries. So Gonzaga, you weren't able to go to games the last couple of years because of not, I, I don't know. I don't, I don't remember the exact gotcha. wording, but you weren't at games the last couple of years. Where does that stand? Are you comfortable sharing with sure. that? And do you hope to get back to Gonzaga in games in the near future? Absolutely. But there's, there's a little water that's gone into the bridge. So it started with, you know, COVID, they were demanding vaccines or vaccine uh, or tests, which both I think I, I know it's against the law. You can't force a, a vaccine on anybody. And nobody can. Your government can't. It's against the law. It's against the Nuremberg Code, which all the countries in the world have adopted. Um, so you, you're not supposed to be able to force a drug on anybody. Additionally, you're not supposed to be able to force testing on anybody, which the PCR test is an invasive test, which they did. And so they were insisting on both to attend a game. And we kind of worked our way around that. And the other thing they were insisting on is a mask. Masks aren't healthy, and I've done enough research and checked with people. They had people that OSHA asks about masks, the, pitch, the people that the military ask about masks, um, and, and the dangers and concerns with those, not to mention the fact that they don't work against a virus. It's like giving chain link to keep out mosquitoes. I mean, it's, it's absurd, and yet that's been the law that a lot of people still to this day believe in. So I sat across from the students at those games, Dan, and just said, wow, I'm, I'm contributing to this. Um, how can I sit here and pretend like that's okay, knowing that it's going to harm those kids either now or in the future, whether it's the shots or the masks, um, and certainly in, in their ability to understand what their freedoms are and what rights they have to never have to do any of them. And so uh, I refused to wear a mask, and that came very I wasn't the only one. There was a lot of people doing it, and, um, but I'm pretty visible. And they said, well, we're going to take your tickets away if that's the case. And I said, well, I'm not wearing a mask. And so... That ended that season. The mask mandate went away the following season, and yet the school maintained their their requirements for COVID vaccines and boosters, which by that time, I mean, I, I'd come out at the time of the mask and said, look, there's been 150 athletes. It was well over 300 at the time. have died on the field from freshly being vaccinated. Um, they called me a liar. A fact check said it was false. I mean, there was a lot of things that went into it, but it, none of it's false. In fact, I was understating it. So... 
by that time, next season rolls around, there's so much more data out. The, the uh, Ed Dowd in his book came a little bit later, but all that data on all cars mortality being up four times what it's ever been in her history for people 15 to 40 to 55, which is working age has never been this high, including war years. And it all traces back to the moment they started the vaccine program, the art, which isn't even a vaccine. So when when they when I knew those facts and I knew that those facts I knew they had those facts because I passed them on to them. Um, when they decided to stick with the mandate and the requirements, uh, I said I I can't come back. I can't. And again, it's no skin off their nose. They, they can fill the seats, but uh, it's something I can't I can't know and not say. Sure, and I appreciate your willingness to to stand true and hold to to what your beliefs are. And I think unfortunately, there's not a lot of people that. Uh, have looked into it as much and as in depth as you have. Uh, is there any movement as far as what the requirements might be in the future? So you'd be back at games? No, in fact, I was starting to get a little bit more vocal on it. I, I don't, I don't want to embarrass the school. I love the school. Um, I always have. You know, it's it's as much a part of me as my family is. And so I don't want to embarrass the school. And yet, they're one of many, many most universities in this country that are still demanding that. And it's, again, it's against the law amongst other things. It's, it's immoral to, to put financial uh, or any gains ahead of that, the, the, the health and well-being of your students. So, so no, what the only movement, so when, as I got more vocal, I thought maybe I'll get a little budging, maybe there'll be a little budging. And what had happened was they, they re-upped, they said, they made a statement that said, we're keeping it through the, the whole spring term. And, um, no, I, I just don't see how that's okay. Yeah. Well, let's shift back to basketball okay. a little bit. Um, NBA playoffs are going right now. Um, when when you sit back and watch a game, um, what does your eye gravitate towards? Well, that's a great, great question. Um, I don't know that I've sat down. I haven't sat down and watched an NBA in some time. When I watch a game, whether it's – sit down and watch a high school game. I, I think what I see, I like to look for signs of intelligence. Um, you know, does this kid, even if, because you know, everybody notices the talent, everybody notices, can you do this? Can you do that? But if you're taking consistently taking bad shots that hurt your team, um, that bothers me. If you continue to miss a guy that's open, like you're just sitting there and because you're, you're entwined in whatever it is you're operating, you can't see a guy full open. That bothers me. When, uh, defense is set in place and somebody's working their tail off out here and they get beat or a screen happens and they, the guy gets a little edge and nobody budges and nobody sees the advantage, you know, mm -hmm. developing and reacts to it. I have a problem with that. So I'm not a fun fan. I'm, I'm pretty grouchy because <laughs> I see a lot of stuff I don't like and just think, why isn't anybody doing this? So that's why I keep quiet. About it. I've, I've seen that grouchiness uh, at Sunday <laughs> open gyms before <laughs> a, a young kid doesn't understand like, no, you're standing right where the cut needs to happen. Get the heck out. Um, how about when you, when uh, your playing career was done and you talked about kind of, in the middle of the night, moving back to Spokane, did any part of you say, I want to get into coaching, not just my kids, but coach at the college level, coach at the NBA level? Um, was that a thought? Was there any opportunities presented? Yeah, it's never been far off thoughts. Um, you know, I, I've enjoyed when I've had chances to work with Gonzaga guys, whether it's, you know, Sunday hoops or whatever. I've always enjoyed that to have talented guys that can pick up what you say, understand it and and engage it right away. That's pretty fun. Similarly pro at the pros, I've had a few guys that I've worked with and, and that's pretty special. They're, they're, they're pros for a reason. So, you know, I've definitely enjoyed that. But when I first moved back, I remember there was such a focus for me on, on look, I've, I've been out running around playing basketball for a long while here. It's, I want to be, it's not like I felt the duty that wasn't there. I wanted to be involved in the kid's life. I wanted to help where I could. And and um, so I pretty much engaged in that fully. And when opportunities were mentioned or came up, I just said, I can't imagine missing this season of my daughter. You know, they have a state championship level team. I can't imagine leaving that season and not being fully engaged in it. So, and I was helping as a coach as well. So yeah, I, the opportunities have been there and, and uh, other opportunities were better. How about a typical day in life for you now? Um, do you still working out? Do you... 
I know you have different business interests. Um, you're becoming kind of a uh, somebody that a lot of people reach out to on the on the COVID and the vaccine stuff. What does a typical day look like for you um, each week? It continues to be busy, which I like. Uh, I'm not good at sitting still and, and from everything. I mean, I'm waiting for the snow to thaw around here so I can rake my yard, you know, clean it up. Cause I, I, I got to do that right now this, this week. Yeah. People look out there. You rake your own yard. Yeah. What do you mean? Do I rake my own yard? Um, I do. And I, I enjoy that. So there's, there's those types of things. There's if my kids, like when David's and David was in town for a week between seasons, what do I do? Well, I end up going and rebounding and talking and working on some hoop stuff for a week and, um, I've got grandkids now, so if, if there's opportunities with basketball with that, or just being a grandpa and doing and engaging in that, uh, there are some businesses that I participate in. I don't think I'm the the crucial element of any of them, but uh, but they're fun. They're they're keep my mind alive. And then of course this COVID thing that mostly mostly the sense of freedom and how we need to we all need to recognize our freedom and fight for it a little bit now before it's really irreparably harmed and, and has, has been a big push for me of late. Uh, is it the athlete defense? What what was that? I know that's uh, been talked about lately. Yeah, I, we I do a podcast uh, myself uh, with Ken Rutgers. He's a former Green Bay Packer Hall of Famer and uh, offensive lineman, great guy. We've been doing podcasts for Voices for Medical Freedom. You, you can check it out, voicesformedicalfreedom.com, dot com, and it's on Rumble and Spotify, whatever. And we've been interviewing some amazing people, including people that have actually put the tests on the 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 vaccine tests people have been harmed by it that were married to the anyway there's some phenomenal people i've had a chance to talk to that uh that have been on these things so um yeah that's been a big part i'll do three interviews a week like that um a couple with you know like this one i'm doing three this morning so i'm trying to really get the word out if 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 i get two people to understand that freedom's worth fighting for then it's uh then it's a success why do you think there's so much skepticism about all this new information that's come out well, it doesn't, it doesn't take me. You look at the news, you look at TV commercials, you look at the billboards. I mean, they're, WashingtonState.gov is still advertising vaccines plus boosters are safe and effective. <laughs> I mean, to me, in, in the world I'm looking at and everything I read, and, and again, I'm talking to, to brilliant people with all the pedigrees that you need, PhDs and Nobel laureates and all these things, and, and they're all saying the same thing, and yet our, our government, Washington state government is saying it's still safe and effective. Now I don't get it, but when you wonder why people aren't a hundred percent on board, it's because they're bombarded with it from television to the radio, to the news, to billboards. John, I appreciate the time. We're going to finish with rapid fire. It's okay. exactly what you think it is. A quick question and a quick answer. It might be one or the other. So, um, if you could swap lives with anyone for a week just to see what their life is like, who would you want that to be? <laughs> you want a quick answer here? <laughs> that one guy, I guess, could go a little longer. Wow. <laughs> um, and they have to be alive? I guess they don't have to be alive. I think it'd be neat to see what, what Jack Nicholas um, is thinking these days. Jack Nicholas, Awesome. Biggest pet peeve? Uh, laziness and complaining. Uh, where'd you go on your last vacation? To see the kids, uh, overseas to see the kids play. Awesome. What country? Uh, France and Germany. Where in France and where in Germany? Oh, France, Hanover, Germany. Okay. Awesome. That's where Michael's playing, obviously. Michael's in France and Laura's actually playing in the, uh, the championship today as we speak. She, her game, her, uh, final series is taking place right now. Well, good luck to her. Thanks. Three things you can't live without. Well, Food, water, air. Uh, <laughs> you know, family is is numero uno. Uh, that's that's the that's probably one, two, and three. Uh, I know you're one of the healthiest guys that I know, but favorite junk food? There's got to be something. Oh, cheeseburgers. Is that is that junk food? Cheeseburgers? Uh, no, because I think red meat's gotten a bad rap. I mean, okay. I'll take a good steak any day of the oh, week. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Um, cookies. Cookies. Oh, yeah, Cookie Monster. What do you wish you learned sooner? Wow. Ec macroeconomics, probably, you know, to understand what, what forces are against us uh, or, or with us in, at a big level. Uh, golf or tennis? <laughs> 
tennis before golf now. Gotcha. Yeah. Uh, favorite way to work out? Basketball. Just playing. What is one thing you'll never do again in your life? Um, pole vault. You pole vaulted before? No. That's oh. why I tried it. <laughs> I tried it. It was very, uns very unsuccessful. And I think I literally went, that's it. Well, that's that for me, that's ice skating. My daughters are ice skaters. <laughs> you saw me the last time I was on skates, ended up with a broken hand. So. Yeah, I could see why you'd say that. Yeah. And what is one habit that changed your life? Wow. Um, it, it has to be, you know, the, the healing habit of healing and, and, and that whole process. It's, it's not a little thing. It's a big thing, but it's um, probably that's changed my life the most. Awesome. Well, I know I took a lot of your time this morning. You and I don't get a chance to sit and talk about this many things for this long a time. Usually we're in a gym and there's other things going sure. on, but uh, I really appreciate the time. Uh, hopefully our listeners in, enjoyed it. Um, if there's anything you want to finish with, a thought, uh, a memory, an experience uh, that you know you would love to share, go for it. Yeah, let's pull those right out of your hat. It's pretty tough. I mean, I... I uh... I've loved growing up and living in this community and come back and coming back to this community. I'm, I'm just at home here. And whether that's a Jack and dance tavern with, you know, where my dad ran that for almost 50 years and, or, or down at campus, um, it's been home sweet home for me. And so, you know, those things are worth fighting for and you have to give up things sometimes to, to get what you know to be right back. Awesome. Well, John, thanks for the time. I appreciate it. And uh, I'm sure we'll see each other again soon. Oh, I'm sure, Dan. Thank you. For Gonzaga Nation Media Network and the ISO, John Stockton, Dan Dickow, thanks for listening.